remember i always tell you that in surgical oncology dnb and mcs surgical onco exam there are two basic cases which make or break they are the easiest but nobody can perform it including us if we come as a student well one is an lavc and another is a oral cancer mandatory every surgical onco student dnb and mcs get these two case compulsorily and this is the case which takes you away there is no limit or end to master this everything is less so this is the most important practical and theory and lbc is something which is so vast the concept what more than what to say you must know what not to say and what not to write which is wrong so when this topic came i had only one person in mind my very close friend senior most surgical oncologist faculty for dnb surgical oncology my great great senior from gcri dr dg vijay who hails from karnataka but settled down in uh, you know ahmedabad uh, he is mch from gcri special interest and practices only breast oncology and breast oncoplasty so you know qualified surgical oncologist very senior also they run a very successful dnb surgical oncology teaching program where he is a teacher too so and he has a vast experience of more than around close to 3 decades in this field excellent surgeon excellent teacher great academician Uh, you heard him speaking in most of the webinars conferences national international so it's my pleasure to invite uh, my senior one of a very great academician good surgeon especially dedicated breast uh, surgeon and oncoplasty surgeon in this field who can cover this i requested him to cover basic to advanced and he has a beautiful module which he has made called as 10 commandments you know not only for students even for all practicing people it's very useful so i hope uh, you will utilize this opportunity is time is very precious difficult to put everything in one slide in topic like this it looks so easy but when you start preparing you know it is so tough to do it because rapid advancement has happened i hope you utilize this at the end of it in the last 10 minutes in q and a or chat box ask your doubts which are relevant for this topic and exams or this uh, you know relevant any subject thank you very much vijay for accepting our invitation and over to you thank you dr somshekar thank you for the kind uh, introduction uh so as dr som pointed out uh, locally advanced breast cancer is a very vast uh, subject and i will be of course uh, uh, highlighting many of the aspects but some of the things you might happen that you might have to you know uh, go into the details based on this particular uh, lecture so as you know we in india we see about anywhere between 160000 to 200000 new cases of breast cancer every year approximately 50% of them are likely to be locally advanced breast cancer there is of course it uh, inter uh, hospital variation uh, dr som and i where we work they are sort of tertiary uh, uh, breast cancer centers and therefore the incidence of labc might be less but in general hospitals and general cancer centers it might happen that the incidence of locally advanced breast cancer may be slightly higher uh, uh, uh like dr som i hope one of you becomes the next torch bearer of breast cancer care in india these are some of the uh, legends on whose shoulders we have moved forward in the form of uh, dr william halstead bernard fisher and dr umberto vinodisi our generation was uh, privileged to hear Uh, these two gentlemen come to india and uh, we could uh, hear their lectures and their thoughts on the management of breast cancer i thought it was a great uh, opportunity for our generation uh, first of all i would like to define what is locally advanced breast cancer as you know uh, inflammatory breast cancer extensive edema edema of the skin ulceration fixation to the bony chest wall edema of the ipsilateral skin fixed axillary nodes or positive supraclavicular nodes these are all the signs of inoperability and this is what we knew as hagenson's criteria or stage b in when we were when i started out as dr somshekar pointed out uh, about 3 decades ago we were calling this as stage d uh, metastatic or locally advanced breast cancer and this was practically inoperable and many times incurable uh, rapid advances have taken place in the treatment of uh, locally advanced breast cancer and uh, initially we used to include t3 t4 tumors and n2 n3 disease as you can see in this particular these were defined as locally advanced breast cancer but as advances in chemotherapy took place uh, we in also included certain other uh, uh, 
earlier subsets into the form of giving them uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy. So T3 was considered as large operable breast cancer, but it might seem to be a certain subset of them. It might be a good idea to downstate the disease with uh, preoperative chemotherapy and then operate. So T3, T4, N2, N3 disease, uh, some T2 uh, disease which is amenable to uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and we have now gone as far to include some T1 uh, cases also, especially the node positive cases and that has been the practice of Dr. Soam and myself where uh, especially triple negative and HER2 positive disease, we often tend to, even with small tumors, we often tend to give them NACT. So, uh, coming to the definition of inflammatory breast cancer is a rapid onset of erythema and edema of the skin and with a period of less than six months. This we will uh, capture later. So, as I told you, it's a very difficult disease to treat. Uh, surgeons uh, at the initial uh, start of the century used to do very radical. Hagenson was a person who defined radical mastectomy. They did very radical surgeries, but with very uh, poor local control and uh, the surgical outcomes were also very disastrous. And as more and more surgeons got involved, we went into supra-radical, extended radical uh, mastectomies, but it was with the same result, poor local control and extreme morbidity of these procedures. People have also tried uh, uh, radical radiation for local control, but again, that has not worked. What has probably worked is surgery with local RT, which gives better local controls, but very poor overall survival. The first step that happened was uh, DLINA in 1972, at the use of NACT to render them resectable. So now that we know the definition or what exactly we mean when we talk about locally advanced breast cancer, so prima facie, it is not a good case for surgery. It needs to be downstaged by new adjuvant chemotherapy and then we can proceed for uh, further surgical management. All these cases should be now treated as a form of a multimodality treatment starting with systemic therapy first. Every institution must have their own protocols and tumors must be discussed in multidisciplinary tumor board whenever results are not as expected. Coming to the metastatic workup of uh, these, uh, the pre-treatment protocol, all these patients, uh, I have not been uh, able to include what uh, Dr. Soam pointed out as the 10 commandments, but at this point, one of the commandments is that imaging comes first, followed by biopsy and then the metastatic workup. So, mammography with an, an ultrasound of the breast and the axilla should be carried out. Biopsy preferable is always a uh, uh, USG guided or a handheld uh, core needle biopsy and the tissue needs to be sent for immunohistochemistry, ER, PR and her 2 new. KI67 has seen a resurgence in local times and uh, we will address that issue. Though the NCCN guidelines uh, recommend CT, thorax, uh, abdomen, pelvis and a bone scan if indicated as metastatic workup, I would still for the purpose of convenience do and that could be your institutional practice also to do a PET CT scan. You should be aware of the limitations of doing a PET CT scan otherwise it is a fantastic uh, single modality for doing metastatic workup. Um, if the nodes are positive then it is also a good idea to either if again you are doing targeted axillary dissection to uh, clip the nodes. Uh, the primary tumor also needs to be clipped and some, at some times the tumor is very large there is a lot of edema and therefore uh, either if the tumor is small and amenable to uh, clipping you can do it at that time or you can do it at a later time when the uh, after a couple of cycles of uh, chemotherapy but the location of the tumor has always to be kept in mind because the patient might uh, want a breast conservation surgery once the size of the tumor becomes smaller. Different hospitals have different ways of localizing this particular uh, the tumor. So basically, as I told you, what are the indications for candidates for preoperative systemic therapy are inflammatory breast cancer, N2, N3 disease, T3, T4 tumors, and in select patients, If even if the tumor is T2 or equal to T2, N1, HER2, triple negative, because they are exquisitely sensitive to new adjuvant chemotherapy. A lot of clinicians here and abroad have moved away from primary surgery to giving uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy. Sometimes the tumor may be large and it may not be amenable to uh, uh, breast conservation surgery. It's a good idea to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then operate. Uh, it can also be considered, as I told you, for T1, N0, where HER2 positive TNBC patients. Uh, 
the benefits of NACT are huge and that is why it has come to play such a dominant role in the management of locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, in fact, uh, what Dr. Somshekar was pointing out that uh, there are entire conferences dedicated to advanced breast cancer, especially the one taking place in Lisbon, Portugal is called ABC and it's one of the world's most prominent uh, breast cancer conferences because it addresses primarily the problem of advanced breast cancer. Um, so what NACT does is that inoperable disease becomes operable. You might be able to do a mastectomy for some patients who are not cases in candidates for mastectomy. You can do breast conservation surgery if the tumor shrinks substantially and the indications are fulfilled. It provides a lot of prognostic uh, information and we can identify patients with residual disease. Now, this has become a very, very important milestone in the management of breast cancer because for residual disease, we have adjuvant treatments and we can modify. It also gives us time for genetic testing. Uh, so, patients can be tested for genetic testing, BRCA tests, and based on the BRCA report, we might do a prophylactic mastectomy, which I will also discuss now. You can also plan reconstruction. Uh, and discuss these cases with your uh, plastic surgeon. So if the node clinically node positive patients becomes node negative, you can do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. You can modify the preoperative treatment, postoperative treatment, and even radiation nowadays has become uh, tailor-made. So one size fits all is not working. So if you need radiation, the fields of radiation might also change. One of the very important things that has happened in LABC is that it is a fantastic platform to test novel therapies and predictive biomarkers. So based on the results of drugs and markers in locally advanced breast cancer, they have got fast track approval for because the tumor is in vivo and you can actually see the drug working in real time. So either uh, most of the chemotherapy drugs which are used preoperatively are the same ones which are used postoperatively. So there is no difference in the long-term outcomes. This is another very, very key word, pathological complete response, and it is associated with an extremely favorable outcome. Particularly, this the correlation between uh, PCR, pathological complete response, and long-term uh, outcomes is strongest for 3NBC somewhat less for HER2 positive disease and least for ERPR positive disease. As I will show you in the subsequent slides, there are multiple options for HER2 negative and HER2 positive breast cancer. Patients with uh, HER2 positive disease should be treated with trastuzumab and pertuzumab should be added, especially when the tumor is larger than T2 or node positive. Uh, with that, we can move forward. Uh, as you know, this is another, the dominal classification of breast cancer should be known to all the uh, DNB residents, uh, how we classify them into uh, A, B, um, HER2 positive. They, all the definitions of this particular thing should be known and this is how the distribution of the tumors in our own uh, institutes takes place. So these are the, so the, now we have agreed what is the definition of LABC. We know that it is not amenable to surgery we will require new adjuvant chemotherapy. So now the treatment takes two paths. One of HER2 negative, the treatment is different. HER2 positive, the treatment is different. For HER2 negative, the treatment options are dose-dense AC, doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, again followed by paclitaxel every two weeks. So previously we were giving all these therapies three weekly. So you must know why we are giving dose-dense uh, the uh, the pharmacokinetics of dose-dense therapies and the evidence which is there for the treatment of uh, breast cancer, why we give dose-dense. So this is one of the most uh, common, uh, especially in young patients with aggressive disease. There are two things that I have highlighted. Uh, sometimes when you are giving uh, AC and there may be some optimal response, some clinicians tend to add platins, which is carboplatin or uh, so carboplatin. So there could be combination of paclitaxel with carboplatin or docetaxel with carboplatin. Though the inclusion of platin agents as neoadjuvant therapy for triple negative, this is a controversial subject. However, it leads to larger uh, complete responses. And however, this does not translate into better long-term outcomes. But if you want a higher 
come uh, response rate, then it might be a good idea to add platin to paclitaxel after the completion of AC when it is not giving optimal uh, downstaging. Uh, there is also the use of olapari, but I think we will discuss this in a subsequent uh, slide. Uh, immunotherapy, all DNB residents know, plays a very, very important role in the management of all cancers. Similarly, for uh, breast cancer, it is very important. And pembrolizumab is the drug of choice for uh, some patients. We will discuss this in a subsequent slide. So, uh, anthracycline, by which we mean doxorubicin and pyrubicin, is the first drug that came in a big way for the use of new adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is the trial, NSABP18 trial. The response rates were up to 80%, though the pathological CR, path CR rates were low, but a lot of patients, if you see this particular slide, patients who received preoperative chemotherapy, 68% of them, you could do a breast conservation surgery, but they received chemotherapy post-operatively, only about 60% of them could undergo. So these are some of the earlier trials done by NSABP, the B18, by which, so you have to know, these are certain landmark trials, NSABP B18, NSABP B27, so which uh, introduced, uh, 18 introduced anthracycline, adriamycin, doxorubicin in the treatment of uh, 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 locally advanced breast cancer and as an adjuvant. Then, in fact, anthracyclines are very, very effective drugs in the HER2 negative breast cancer, but for HER2 positive, now there is a statement which says that there is no advantage of an anthracycline containing regimen in stage 2, stage 3, HER2 positive. So, it is the entire concept of anthracycline is being revisited by this trial called TRAIN2 uh, for HER2 positive disease. But it continues to play a stellar role as far as HER2 negative disease is concerned. So these are some of the trials which are uh, the strong uh, predictors for the use of taxanes in uh, locally advanced breast cancer, the Aberdeen trial. I do not go into the uh, schema and the results of these particular trials. Uh, but again, I want to point highlight that if you see uh, the patients who received taxotere had a higher percentage, uh, 67 versus 48 percent of patients who received uh, CVAP, and these are higher number of patients underwent breast conservation surgery. So this is how the treatment, so this is the evidence for the use of anthracycline. This is the evidence for the use of taxanes. And the other very important trial is the NSABP 27, which said that the addition of four cycles of preoperative docetaxel after four cycles of preoperative AC significantly increased clinical and pathological response rates for operable breast cancer. These were not as high as they are today, but they were the step one, you know. Uh, uh, we have, history takes place in small steps and that is from this, we have progressed to this particular point where we can get response rates up to 60-70%. There is no head-to-head -head comparison between docetaxel and paclitaxel. They have their own uh, side effects and based on the side effects and the patient profile, you have to consider the drug. Uh, Paclitaxel, however, plays a major role in the management of locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, this is the slide which talks about the use of pembrolizumab, an immunotherapeutic drug in locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, and I also talked about platins. So these are, what is the evidence for the use of platins? Is These are the various trials, the GPAR-62, CalGB. And uh, based on this, as you can see, the path CR rates improve, but this somehow does not translate into overall uh, survival results. So path CR without carboplatin, 30%, with carboplatin, 55%. This is the data. You have to, everything in oncology, there is a justification for that. So nothing happens by bias. So what is the evidence? What is the trial? How did this come into play? Everything you have to know. Uh, that is why I am constantly quoting these trials. I do not go into the details of these trials. It may not be necessary for uh, all the time, but you have to know some of these landmark trials and be able to quote the and even point out the discrepancies which might be there in various trials. So, pembrolizumab, the trial is based on the Keynote 522. Uh, 
another important thing that i want to point out at this point of time is that the entire treatment of breast cancer and other cancers also has taken place on the concept of escalation and de escalation so what do we mean by that whenever there is a good response to the initial treatment we tend to de escalate the therapies so if there is no good response add paclitaxel so no no like that or if it is an advanced disease we want to want to escalate the treatment for her to positive we may want to add her to zumab so there could be a question in your theory exam there could be a question during this uh, uh, viva regarding escalation de escalation uh, theories i mean uh, steps in the management of breast cancer for as far as her to positive breast cancer is concerned the various uh, chemotherapy regimens are paclitaxel trastuzumab we might add drugs for more advanced disease or tch docetaxel carboplatin trastuzumab or tchp um, what happens if there is not optimal response we will discuss with that but some early t1 n0 low risk patients it is possible that you might give only paclitaxel and trastuzumab and you may not give carboplatin you may not give pertuzumab and this uh, is based on a trial uh, by sara tolani called the apt trial which did not they specifically looked for early her to positive breast cancer and used these drugs so probably this is the same slide so these are the data for the use of her to positive uh, breast cancer the noa trial the techno trial and uh, uh, clinicians such as jiani and aman buzdar at the md anderson cancer center have made uh, great contribution in the uh, early uh, clinical trials regarding trastuzumab the entire story of how the uh, cerb her2 gene was discovered and how the antibody trastuzumab was discovered is done by dr dennis lemon at uh, los angeles and we have had the opportunity to listen to him and it's a very interesting story which you can read in wikipedia how this uh, the development of her2 the gene anti the gene and the antibody took place and uh, what all efforts these people have made in the initial years so uh, to make life so easy for us the other wonderful drug in the treatment of uh, her2 positive is trastuzumab this is based on the neosphere trial as you can see uh, the addition of pertuzumab gives excellent uh, pathological complete response rates and dual blockade is more effective than single agent trastuzumab in the new adjuvant setting yet with the addition of chemotherapy so trifena and neosphere these are the two trials which are for the justification of pertuzumab as you can see this is a slide which shows that as you proceed from trastuzumab to pertuzumab the response rates will improve pcr and it will translate into higher pcr rates it has come to a situation where the american society for breast surgeons went on to say that any tumor greater than 2 cm or node positive should receive new adjuvant chemotherapy with the addition of trastuzumab or pertuzumab so this completes the entire picture of locally advanced the ad new adjuvant chemotherapy for her2 positive her2 negative now what happens at the end of giving all this chemotherapy is there are high clinical rates 80 to 90% uh, the pathological response rates may vary there is an increase in the rate of lumpectomy increasing path cr as you can see in this particular slide 10 to 15% with anthracycline 25 to 30 with anthracycline and taxanes 40 to 50 with chemo and trastuzumab and 50 to 60 with chemo and double or two blockade axillary positivity as you can see will also go down with the addition of anthracycline taxanes and single agent double agent or two therapies it is very uh, important and dr somshekar is very fond of this particular topic which is called path cr pathological complete response total pathological complete response is the widely accepted definition of pcr so when you give new adjuvant chemotherapy and you do the surgery and the biopsy report the histopathology report suggests that all the cancer cells in the breast and in the lymph nodes has uh, disappeared that is called as pathological complete response however t pcr allows it is y p p0 in situ carcinoma as far as the breast is concerned and 
YPN0, so absence of invasive cancer in the breast and the nodes, irrespective of DCIS in the breast. Who are the patients who are likely to achieve a higher PCR rates are younger patients, more aggressive disease, smaller disease, ductal carcinoma, high KI-67, high-grade tumors are the ones who are likely to have a higher response to the drugs that I pointed out. That is why triple negative breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer, which are theoretically uh, aggressive, high-risk, fast-growing tumors have a higher response rates to chemotherapy. Again, this uh, pathological complete response is also important uh, prognostically because those patients who achieve a path CR have superior outcomes compared to women who do not achieve a path CR. What it means is that there is some residual disease which is resistant to the standard line of chemotherapy. So whether it is by a meta-analysis or the analysis of the B18 in the B27 trial, it is clear that PCR translates into uh, overall better survival, especially this correlation is strongest for triple negative, HER2 and hormone receptor in that particular sequence. This is the CT-NEO-BC trial which also basically points out. If you have seen this particular edition of the NCCN, There is this concept of CPSEG, which is a more refined categorization of breast cancer patients. It includes clinical stage, pathological stage, estrogen receptor, and nuclear grade. As you can see, this uh, you must. Uh, it was a new concept that I learned about, uh, so it was not there initially. And everything has a scoring system, and based upon the scoring system, suppose. Clinical stage, pathological stage, receptor status, nuclear grade, depending upon that, depending on the score, the five-year uh, distant metastasis-free survival can be, you can put it into this algorithm and calculate. Uh, so, it also calculates into the
uh, disease free survival as pointed out so, with, so somebody with a score of 6 5 4 3 2 1 0 will have different disease free survival and this has also been proved in meta analysis so uh, this is a new concept and please uh, make sure that you are aware of this it is predominantly currently used in clinical trials but it can indicate risk of recurrence and not included in the guidelines because whatever is the clinical criteria we base further treatment on that only coming to the once you have given the new adjuvant chemotherapy there will be responses in various ways one the tumor can shrink concentrically like this or it can drink, shrink in a honeycomb cheese pattern this is more likely whenever there is a extensive dcis or presence of dcis then it is more likely that the tumor might shrink patchily or even sometimes with invasive cancer for some unknown reason it might happen that the tumor might shrink in this rcb is another favorite uh, uh, royal challengers bangalore the favorite of our uh, dr somshekar and uh, Again, this is a concept based on the primary tumor size in C2 and lymph node metastasis. RCB 1, 2, 3, you should be aware of all these. And again, based in various breast cancer subtypes, PATH CR, RCB 1, more or less, uh, 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 behave or uh, have predict similar outcomes, whereas RCB 2 and RCB 3 predict uh, fairly poor outcomes. So, RCB is something that you should be aware of. Uh, theoretically and how it translates into uh, five year event free five year and 10 year survivals um, can we use the adjuvant chemotherapy yes we can use letrozole for uh, elderly patients who have strong hormone receptor positive uh, breast cancer these are the trials which are used uh, impact uh, letrozole p24 and the proact trial and uh, what it says is that though there is initial response to new adjuvant endocrine therapy it takes a longer time than new adjuvant chemotherapy. It takes four to six months. Response rates may be lower. Early progression is more frequent. And pathological complete response is rare. So if you want a rapid response in a uh, uh, young patient, aggressive disease, then nothing works better than new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, once the new adjuvant chemotherapy is over, there is good response and the patient can undergo surgery, physical examination, ultrasound, and evaluation of the response is very important. MRI breast. So, uh, MRI of the breast can be done preoperatively. MRI can be done postoperatively. Currently, MRI is not recommended routinely for the preoperative evaluation of breast cancer patients. However, if you have in young patients dense breast and patients desirous of breast conservation surgery, uh, MRI can be done. M the, the uh, MRI some, uh, will detect some disease that may not be clinically significant and it renders more patients for uh, mastectomy. But in your institutional uh, protocol, you can include MRI as a part of a evaluation for breast cancer patients. Uh, as I discussed with you, the clip placement is very important preoperatively if the tumor is very large then you can put the clip after a couple of cycles of NACT. How do you localize the clip? The clip at the time of surgery goes to the patient, goes to the nuclear, uh, the radiology department and with a hook wire, you have to be able to localize the uh, clip and the placement of clip gives better local regional control. This is another important slide where if the size of the tumor is 5 centimeter and it shrinks to 3 centimeter. So, People may feel that there is a partial response. Only 2 cm the tumor shrunk. However, the tumor volume shrinks from 85 cubic centimeter to 14 cubic centimeter. And the volume of excision shrinks from 180 cubic centimeter to 65. Because the volume of a sphere is 4, pi, 4 upon 3 pi r cube. So even if there is a uh, small shrinkage in the volume, there is a significant shrinkage in the resection volume. At the current moment, all patients after NACT require surgery. So there is at the moment no data, no trials are going on whether we can avoid surgery in excellent responders. Breast conservation surgery can be done. It has to be done with resecting the residual volume, not as per the original volume. The clear margins like for invasive breast cancer DCS have to be achieved and specimen mammography is useful in uh, evaluating the post-operative, the uh, intraoperative specimens. 
mastectomy. Mastectomy has to be done for patients who have inflammatory breast cancer, persistently positive margins, multicentric lesions. So, but sometimes in initially it is correct to say, though it is not a contraindication to do uh, breast conservation surgery after NACT, if both the tumors can be encompassed in a single excision and planned prophylactic. So, patients who are at low to moderate risk of recurrence, only in those patients should you consider doing a prophylactic contralateral mastectomy. So, uh, you know, in the United States, and there is a very aggressive uh, for contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. So, the low-risk patients, you can evaluate, but if patient already has a very advanced breast cancer on one side, he is more likely to die of metastatic disease in the index cancer rather than doing developing a cancer in the contralateral. All these things have to be discussed. That is why I talked about the multidisciplinary tumor board in the beginning of my lecture, which is very, very important. So the entire treatment of the patient has to be planned on day one. What will be done, whether genetic testing will be done, fertility preservation will be done or not, psycho-counseling of the patient, uh, preparing her for new adjuvant chemotherapy, all that. So as for, that is as far as the local treatment. Breast conservation surgery, based on the data from MD Anderson, is safe and is routinely practiced in our uh, and various centers in uh, India. Um, at this point, I would like to point out that it is very unfortunate that the incidence of locally advanced breast cancer is uh, yet high in our country. Despite the efforts of various surgeons, we have all made various efforts to educate patient education programs and gone to various medical uh, and call medical colleges, but yet the incidence of LABC remains high. ABSI, of which Dr. Somshigar is the president, is the uh, uh, and one of the founder members, has been the voice of breast surgery in India. And constant efforts are being uh, done by all the members of ABSI in the most remote places in India to educate patients. Uh, patient awareness programs are done, but yet I think there is a long way uh, and multiple challenges that we you will face in your career in the treatment of locally advanced breast cancer. So based on the B18, coming back to the topic for the day, the B18 EORTC breast conservation, new adjuvant chemotherapy improves BCH rates. This is a similar uh, meta-analysis. It says that BCS is a safe surgery for patients with LABC who have a good response to NACT. I think more or less the same uh, thing that uh, breast conservation surgery is safe and the addition of NACT improves uh, breast conservation surgery rates. These are various. So as you can see in this particular, the tumor was uh, very, very big at the time of presentation and it has become very small uh, after a new adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is these are some slides where I will just point out that a clip has been placed here preoperatively Inside the tumor, a hook wire has been placed and the tumor has been widely excised. In this particular patient, you can see the clip here, I hope, and a palpable tumor here. Both the tumors were in the same vicinity. Two hook wires have been placed and both the tumors have been excised. These clips have been placed for the specimen mammography for orienting the lateral margin, medial margin, anterior, superior. So besides the stitch, you also need to place clips to identify the margins. Again, in this particular patient, there was a palpable tumor and a clip in C2 and breast conservation surgery has been done with, as you, the specimen mammogram is an excellent way of evaluating the gross margins for a resection tumor. So, of course, there could be some problems associated with breast conservation surgery. Uh, coming to the address, and so how do you address the axilla? So, coming to addressing the axilla, it is very important for you to understand that preoperatively, if the patient is N0, then you should do a, some institutions do sentinel lymph node biopsy before NACT. But almost all institutions today would do sentinel lymph node biopsy after NACT. Having said that, um, if the patient was N0, you should do a sentinel lymph node biopsy after NACT. 
if the patient was n1 you can still do with limited nodal disease you can still do a slnb however please remember that if the patient had a n2 n3 disease before initiation of nact you must always do a aland axillary lymph node dissection so publication of three randomized controlled trials the ecosoc 71 sentinel fnc demonstrated that it is not very difficult and almost easy to be able to identify the sentinel lymph node even though the uh, nact has been given there is fibrosis and there is lot of theoretical discussion but you can still identify the S sentinel lymph node with a false negative rate of 10% uh, though it has gone down to less than 5% in various institutions you must do your own pilot study of about 20 30 cases and be confident about doing uh, uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy post nact in n0 disease and then uh, proceed further you could use you should use a dual tracer technique so uh, it could be a blue dye it could be a radioactive dye or it could be an icg dye uh, you know an icg green dye so dr somshekar has again been the pioneer in the uh, use of the icg probe in india and has a very extensive experience of uh, doing icg uh, we do with uh, the radioactive dye and the blue dye and we are yet to gain access to the icg uh, system what nact does is you know as i discussed in the previous slides nact node positive the rate of sentinel lymph node positivity after nact goes down very substantially so if you see nact sentinel lymph nodes were positive only in 33% of patients whereas if you had done an upfront surgery and a sentinel lymph node biopsy 48% of patients would have had a positive sln again you can see there is what it does is it sterilizes the disease which is there in the sentinel lymph so for node positive disease an acceptable false negative rate of anywhere between 5 to 10% is acceptable and at least three nodes two nodes have three nodes have to be identified excised and a dual tracer technique uh the what nct also does is more patients they get a higher Uh, response rates in the axilla surprisingly than in the breast so if across all uh, subtypes if you see the breast pcr rates versus the axillary pcr rates are much higher in the axillary pcr rates so when the axilla is giving pathological response especially with the use of dual agent hal2 and it and in triple negative it is uh, criminal today to do a complete axillary lymph node dissection remove 25 lymph nodes and then tell the patient that all the 25 lymph nodes are negative this is very true in triple negative breast cancer hal2 positive breast cancer where the path cr rates as i told you are going to be very very high hal2 it is the rates are the highest suppose when you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy and you identify itc or micrometastasis as this particular slide points out there could still be additional positive nodes identified on aland so nearly 18% to 20% of patients who have itc on sentinel lymph node could still harbor additional positive nodes so unlike primary slnb not nact without nact when uh, based on the z11 study if the node is positive even then we don't do a complete aland however it is our recommendation that when itcs or micrometastases are identified on sentinel lymph node biopsy post nact it might be a harbinger of additional disease within the axilla so you have to uh, individualize this treatment the nccn says that when micrometastases are identified you may not do a complete aland but you have to keep this particular uh, this was a, a presentation at the sabcs uh, 2020 and uh, from the dana farber cancer institute and they are of the recommendation that even if itc or micrometastases are identified on slnb post nact the patient should go for aland 
so as you can see the uh, even the disease free survival uh, is for n0 itc and micrometastasis is uh, different and in fact for lower for itc and micrometastasis so it is important that uh, patients who have this sort of disease should proceed with an aland uh, this is another of dr somshekar's favorite topic where marking of the axillary nodes with radioactive seeds because this involves a lot of this thing so various methods are being tried in uk especially and in us to mark the positive axillary node with radioactive seed super magnetic oxide and various dyes are being tried to mark the positive axillary node pre nsct and then at the end of uh, the nsct it is very important to go back and excise that mark node this is called targeted axillary dissection targeted axillary dissection and uh, by that you can reduce the uh, the reduce the false negative rates so this is the same slide which says that aland can be avoided for 40% of patients with nodal metastasis and no standard contraindications to slnb basically the same thing which says that er negative or to positive patients have a higher response rates and you can definitely avoid aland in some of these patients margins is another issue as far as breast conservation is concerned nsc uh, and post nsct also it remains a challenge so the the excise specimen uh, you may or may not send it for frozen section but on, if on the final section uh, reporting margins come as positive as per the current definitions for invasive breast cancer or dcis you might need to revise the margins or if multiple ex revisions are positive you might even need to go for a mastectomy but if there is significant shrinkage of the tumor or if they are path cr then the margins don't matter so this is a study from uh, christy in the published in the annals of surgical oncology decreased number of positive margins decreased rate of reoperation and as you can see it is uh, significant reduced by the use so nsct is like a, a wonder drug and the use of nsct across all of locally advanced large operable breast cancer and even for some early breast cancer provides huge opportunity for interventions which are you know paradigm shift it's a paradigm shift and you can do uh, wonders if you use nsct the excision following primary surgery because margins are negative it it's required only in about 20% of patients patients if they have path cr and you do a wide excision then the report comes back as saying that there is a pathological complete response once all the cancer cells have died then the margins really don't matter uh, moving forward rapidly whether we can eliminate surgery because of such excellent response in the breast and in the axilla so these are some uh, studies currently uh, trials are going on especially with the use of a vacuum assisted biopsy whether we can avoid surgery at all but this will take many uh, more years to these studies will take many more years to mature and these are the ongoing trials which uh, talk about this now you have given the new adjuvant chemotherapy you have done the surgery you have addressed the breast axilla you have addressed the margins uh, now if there is what is the post operative treatment for these patients so if the patient is her to positive then and there is a complete response then it is essential to complete all the cycles of uh, adjuvant uh, trastuzumab with or without pertuzumab however if there was no path cr then the current recommendation is to shift these patients to tdm1 for 14 cycles if the patient was hormone receptor positive because these patients are at high risk of uh, uh, recurrence then normally for premenopausal patients we use tamoxifen for postmenopausal patients we use letrozole it might be a good idea to continue these therapies for longer periods of time there is also data by which we can you know escalate the treatment if there is not very good response for triple negative breast cancer currently if there is path cr you just need to observe these patients if there is no path cr then you can give adjuvant capecitabin for her to negative new options that have opened up are adjuvant olaparib for patients who have germline braca mutations or as i pointed out with the keynote 522 uh, the immunotherapy pembrolizumab it have it had been used preoperatively 
recommended only for stage 2, stage 3, triple negative breast cancer, then you can use pembrolizumab in the post-operative setting also. So these are various strategies that we have for managing uh, the patient in the post-operative setting. Uh, if the patient is triple negative, does not achieve patch CR. If the patient is triple negative breast cancer and does not achieve a patch CR after uh, NACT, then we can use the capecitabine. This is the data according to the CREATEX trial that you can see here. This is another landmark trial. Uh, those patients who after preoperative trastuzumab and pertuzumab do not achieve a patch CR. This is the data, the Catherine trial, which recommends the use of TDM1. It reduced the risk of recurrence by 50% when compared with other drugs among patients with residual disease after NACT. Uh, there is also the use recommendation for using neratinib. So this is the trial after the completion of trastuzumab, pertuzumab. For high-risk HER2 positive disease, you can continue. Neratinib is recommended for extended adjuvant treatment of patients with hormone receptor. This can be used only in hormone receptor patients. You have to know the trial for all the this thing. So, for hor uh, uh, hormone receptor positive patients, let tamoxifen for premenopausal patients, letrozol for postmenopausal patients. Whether we can escalate the treatment in some of these patients, yes, we can escalate by doing a ovarian function suppression, which is based on the text and the soft trial. So you should be aware of these particular trials. Uh, Abemacyclib is another uh, drug which is used for combined with endocrine therapy for CDK46 inhibitor to demonstrate a significant improvement in invasive uh, disease-free survival in patients. So, this can be used in select group of high-risk patients which are defined as more than four positive axillary lymph nodes. So, you do the surgery, patient is hormone receptor positive, but there is suboptimal response to NACT. Four of the nodes come positive, one to three nodes come positive, large tumor, histological grade, TI67 is high. So that is, so you think that even after giving NACT, there is some optimal response. So you need to escalate the treatment. How do you escalate the treatment? Either you can do ovarian function suppression or if patient is efforting, you can give a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the form of abemacyclic. So this is a new uh, trial that was uh, submitted at the SABCS 21, uh, 2021 where uh, hormone receptor positive patients were, who were randomized to receiving preoperative chemotherapy and versus endocrine therapy. And this shows that postmenopausal patients in this select group of patients, postmenopausal patients may not have any chemotherapy drug. Premenopausal patients have a significantly higher benefit from new adjuvant chemotherapy. I also uh, alluded to uh, Olaparib, uh, which can be used in patients who have germline RACA mutations. Uh, this is the trial, the Olympia trial, which recommends, which, you know, worked on uh, Olaparib. This is the post-operative radiation. This is a slide from NCCN. So, what is the radiation field uh, if there is complete nodal response? how it will change, whether to include the regional nodal radiation. As Dr. Somshekar pointed out, uh, every aspect of locally advanced breast cancer, you must have your institutional protocol. So if there is N0, uh, path N0, what will be the radiation field? If there is residual disease in the axilla, what will be your radiation fields? Whether you will include the internal memory nodes or not? Uh, or what are the criteria for giving the boost? All this has to be discussed and planned at the time of seeing the patient. So these are whether uh, these are the trials for uh, inclusion of uh, regional nodal radiation and whether uh, axillary radiation is inferior to ALND or not. So these are the two trials which are the modifications of radiation as we know. So to conclude my lecture for today, I think I have done it in good time. Um, 
it is a very vast topic multiple uh, aspects upon the of the disease have to be dealt upon uh, it's a very challenging uh, problem and uh, multimodality treatment is very important initiate treatment with nsct then go on to giving uh, uh, doing the surgery address, do breast conservation surgery as far as possible it's very important for you to train uh, at uh, accredited centers uh, we hope to start a fellowship in breast surgery soon so you can train at any of the major centers you can contact absi for this and come to any of the centers and uh, learn breast conservation surgery post nsct uh, and uh, radiation fields the adjuvant treatment after uh, nsct after surgery these are all various important topics dr somshikar also wanted me to talk about the 10 commandments um, some of the commandments have already been mentioned that you do the imaging first uh, biopsy and then the metastatic workup mastectomy remains the standard of care uh, in our country but breast conservation surgery primarily and after nsct is establishing itself ebsi also is making a lot of effort to popularize breast conservation surgery and various oncoplastic techniques uh, chemotherapy is best planned radiation is best planned by a radiation oncologist chemo by a medical oncologist and the most aggressive treatments have to be planned in these patients and uh, i hope it was a very fruitful uh, interaction and uh, Uh, let us have the question and answers thank you dr som thank you dnb mr krishna for having given us this opportunity to present our uh, thoughts on locally advanced breast cancer fantastic vijay beautiful uh, way there are a lot of questions both in q and a and chat box Okay, I will I will open some from the question first, sir. If the yeah. in TNBC, if the size of the tumor is two centimeter, should operate upfront or new adjuvant chemo? Actually, uh, you know, Vedh Prakash, if you heard uh, Vijay talk, he clearly mentioned gave the evidence, gave the trial and the guideline. But uh, nevertheless, I will request Vijay to repeat it. So uh, again, uh, doctors, we, uh, there is an institutional variation between what one would do for a triple negative two centimeter tumor. Um, as per the current data, I still think that uh, you know again it depends upon the patient choice. So breast conservation surgery is always a patient choice is paramount. So you have to discuss this option anyway. There is there are some people in the world who believe that any patient who is going to receive post operative chemotherapy should receive pre operative chemotherapy. so uh, if you are able to do a breast conservation surgery after nsct by clipping the tumor i think giving nsct is a very good option in tnbc 2 cm lump uh, because you can subsequently plan the adjuvant treatment as i pointed out is very that has become very important in triple negative anyway the prognosis is poor so you want to know the response of the tumor when the tumor is in vivo i would probably 2 uh, cm is really a gray zone depends on patient choice but both options uh, if you weigh both the options probably nsct followed by surgery looks like a good option very good better option yeah i to complete that uh, vedh prakash you know it is very important to understand when me and vijay were doing oncology training uh, even in an labc or a lobc large operable breast cancer there is not a single clinical trial which has shown overall survival benefit by giving chemo up front so we understood if a lesion is operable if the intention is not breast conservation if the primary skin margin can be achieved whether you operate and give adjuvant or give new adjuvant and operate didn't matter but now the era has changed because of createx trial and also catherine trial so createx and catherine told that giving new adjuvant chemo even in an operable breast cancer even in a breast cancer which is amenable for breast conservation at present with the information known rcb score residual cancer burden and if they are rcb 0 1 continuing no further chemo in tnbc or adding 6 months of capsitabine in tnbc or switching over to tdm 1 instead of trastuzumab have a survival benefit these two trial took two set chemo even in an operable breast cancer even in a breast cancer which is amenable for breast conservation at present with the information known rcb score residual cancer burden 
and if they are rcb 01 continuing no further chemo in tnbc or adding 6 months of capsetabine in tnbc or switching over to tdm1 instead of transuzumab as a survival benefit these two trials took 2 cm as a margin so in exam if you want to ask uh, 1 to 2 cm is a gray zone 2 cm tnbc n0 even if they are amenable for breast conservation and presentation 2 cm and above hal2 new positive even if they are amenable for breast conservation at presentation currently as per those two trial we try to give your adjuvant to know the information did we achieve pathological cr next question from gokul is in this era because hardly there is any contraindication for breast conservation what is the absolute contraindication for breast conservation in this era um i would put as uh, inflammatory breast cancer uh, is an absolute contraindication for doing bcs um the uh, standard uh, uh, contraindications to breast conservation surgery are still uh, present uh, uh, if there is a dis- inappropriate tumor to breast ratio having said that there are multiple options in this particular situation where you can give nsct downstage the tumor and then do a bcs or you can uh, uh, do a more complex oncoplastic level 2 uh, oncoplastic procedures if there is a large so previously large tumors were not amenable to bcs but now we have strategies for taking that extensive microcalcification for example is a contraindication for doing Uh, repeat if you do a breast conservation surgery margins come positive after repeated excisions again that is a contraindication to doing uh, a breast conservation surgery so uh, previously again retro so the, it is a very dynamic process previously you know when dr som and i were doing our residency retro areolar tumors and multicentric tumors were considered to be Uh, multifocal tumors were also considered to be contraindications but now there is a saint gallen in fact we have a very uh, you know the the grisotti flap is beautifully designed for retro areolar tumors so retro areolar tumors are no longer a contraindication so it's a dynamic process of learning uh, even multicentric tumors if they are can be encompassed within a single excision are good cases for doing breast conservation surgery So you see that's very able nice. to do local oncoplastic procedures uh, in in summary uh, central quadrant tumor not contraindication nipple areola involvement not contraindication then you know small size to tumor patient not contraindication because volume is uh, replacement flaps like perforator l cap i cap can be done not contraindication braca one braca mutation not contraindication multifocal lesion not contraindication multicentric not contraindication as long as in a right size breast you can remove them so as which i told for a student what is the absolute contraindication inflammatory breast cancer diffuse microcalcification malignant all over the breast and even a previous radiotherapy is not a contraindication as long as even it is before 5 year you can still go and irradiate by various other techniques like abbi interstitial brachii or other so absolute contraindication is inflammatory breast cancer and diffuse malignant microcal all over the breast rest all and then uh, second thing is uh, currently remember t4 lbcs skin involvement lbc stage 3b by virtue of 34 t4b as of today are contraindication even though localized skin involvement people can remove but the Uh, md anderson trial has shown the recurrence are in town of 15% so locally advanced breast cancer not t4a t4b pretty orange skin involvement is still a contraindication unless it's a trial so these are the three things which you must say in exam next is keshav is asking sir in tnbc what other molecular classification should we do in this era vijay indikesh indications for further molecular workup in tnbc for yeah in further tnbc yeah see likos so, we do is6 for erpr how to know ks67 uh, now fish is 2 plus we do uh, if r2 new positive 2 plus we do fish but in tnbc what other recommendation we do now uh, so one the, this is the standard uh, molecular workup in uh, immunohistochemistry workup for breast cancer 
So whether you want to do a PD-1, PDL-1 at the initiation or subsequent to the metastatic disease is a um, you know matter of debate, and uh, whether you are going to use immunotherapy or not. So that is one uh, marker that we would want to do, but uh, we would you know we don't do it at the very outset of uh, diagnosis, even for triple negative breast cancer. Yeah. Now uh, is right. Currently, two more markers which are added is uh, PDL1 because now there is a uh, if it is a PDL1 positive, new adjuvant immunotherapy is a very high level evidence, and adjuvant immunotherapy is also a high level evidence in triple negative. So, PDL1 is all remember this PDL1 is through SPS135. Uh, so, it's a different marker, not the same PDL1 you use in colorectal cancers and other remember this so this is a rosh kit for breast cancer all triple negative breast patients should have a pdl1 if it is positive and what is positive pdl1 is more than 1% is positive uh, both the nuclear and membrane and if any one of them are positive then new adjuvant new adjuvant is recommended and are now all breast cancer uh, needs to have braca one braca2 because then there is a olympia trial where you can give an adjuvant parking uh, next question from Rakesh Kumar is, if post new adjuvant chemo, BCS margin positive, how many attempts should we do? Cut, keep on removing, how many attempts we should now call it a day and convert to mastectomy? I think uh, two attempts are recommended for doing uh, repeat uh, margin excision. I agree. So, if we can't achieve in two, then you know it's unlikely you can achieve. Usually a second revision is a liberal revision and in that you can't get it, then the volume of disease is much more, the response is much patchy. Rakesh also has one more question. MF and MC, what criteria should be used, whether we should follow quadrant system or intertumor distance of 2 to 5 centimeters? I don't see that. What is the question? Uh, and for MF and MC, what criteria should be used, sir? Whether we should follow quadrant system or intertumor distance 2 to 5. I don't know what he meant by MF, MC. Did you understand what it is, Vijay? Multifocality. Multifocality okay. and multicentric. So, should we say quadrant or distant? Uh, both are, you know, the definition is well uh, established. So, both multifocal, the quadrant is also important, the distance is also important. I agree. Off late, most of the octoplasty take uh, more than 2 cm from the primary without intervening DCIS, uh, you know, is multifocal and more than 5 cm without intervening DCIS. But as which I say, it also depends on the cup size of the breast. You know, you may have a D cup and then the distance from one quarter to another may be 6 centimeters. Any uh, role of doing androgen receptor in triple negative breast cancer? Have you been doing androgen receptor in PNBC? Yeah, now a lot of trials are published from Rajiv Gandhi also that uh, now routinely androgen is also there and it's roughly between 5 to 15 percent. And if they are positive, uh, then anti-androgen therapy is also uh, analyzed. So people are... Now, picked up, even though it is not a level 1 evidence, uh, but it's one of the places in LABC, there are a lot of studies and a lot of trials which have come up, uh, which is available actually. Uh, I think that's a good, now not just IHC4, ERPR, her new KA67, FISH if it is her new positive, PDL1 if it is triple negative, BRCA so that you can give adjuvant uh, uh, in inhibitor. In addition to this, uh, now we also do androgen. Manish is asking, comment on the margin in path CR in post NACT. If it is path CR, what margin can you comment? Uh, Vijay, you want to add anything? No, that is the, that is what I told in one of my slides, that if the uh, there is pathological complete response, hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, before. if there is pathological complete response, there is no viable disease within the tumor. So, your excision should be as small as possible and just around the clip and there is very little fibrosis, no palpable tumor and uh, the margins will certainly be negative on the paraffin section. I just want to add one sentence as far as the, uh, uh, the various biomarkers are concerned. 
that they should be done in a central lab and standardization of whether it is ERPR, HER2 new, PDL1, BRCA, everything has to be done in a standard lab at the, in the same place again and again. And if, especially if it is going to be repeated. Absolutely. And remember, students, a ER positive can become ER negative during the course. HER2 new negative can become HER2 new uh, positive. But the vice versa doesn't happen. ER negative doesn't become ER positive. Remember, so in exam, you are supposed to say, whenever there is a recurrence, whenever a first metastasis happen, reco, re-biopsy and repeat because ER positive can become ER negative. Rarely ER negative ever becomes positive. It is not noted. And HER2 new negative can become positive. Positive, the usually doesn't become negative. So, but it's remember, the vice versa holds good. Manish also has a question. Uh, sir, post NACT, PCS is done, but we can't see the fiduciary marker. You have put a clip. How to proceed now? Vijay? Uh, we have done it. Operatively, you cannot see the clip. Uh, with a specimen. So, usually we do a specimen memogram and he is not able to see the clip now and is not sure was the clip there displaced or did I remove the target organ, how to proceed? Uh, because of the extensive fibrosis that takes place, I think sometimes this is a uh, problem where the clip is not identified by the radiologist because of extensive uh, fibrosis. Um, in that particular situation, I think most of the time it is seen on the specimen mammogram. Uh, that is, an ex that is, I think you are also doing it in your clinical practice. I also follow the same thing. And uh, by modifying, ultimately it's a metallic clip and should be seen on the specimen mammogram by very mod modulating the, uh, you know, the intensity of this, this thing. Ultimately, otherwise then you will have to cut open the specimen and identify the clip. I fully agree with you. This unfortunate scenario is only if you are not planned well. You have not done a good uh, mammogram before uh, planning to take after NACT and localized where it is combined with ultrasound. And if you are not done doing an intraoperative specimen mammogram, uh, you would not usually ever have it. And remember, if you don't see clip, it's always left behind in the body. Please go back and then check. Arvind says that, sir, uh, one step ahead. New adjuvant uh, part. So, do you measure. think the use of intra there is increasing use of intraoperative ultrasound even in breast cancer for margin revision? And, uh, uh, you know, people like All India Institute, they are doing it. So, even something like that also help in this scenario. Absolutely. absolutely. Sometimes clip is tough to see in ultrasound, but uh, a mammogram and ultrasound both done together can identify a clip before you take the patient. And a specimen mammogram done on a specimen usually can show it. Arvin I says, is there any views on the, uh, for the internal memory node, of course, is important. But suppose the patient, for the uh, benefit of the postgraduates, uh, suppose the patient had a supraclavicular lymph node, um, uh, which is LABC, N3 disease. So after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the lymph node, the supraclavicular lymph node goes away. Then what will be your treatment plan? And if the supraclavicular node persists, then what will be your treatment plan? Please tell. Okay. Now, if the patient came with a uh, supraclavicular node up front in a neoadjuvant chemo, and if the patient has achieved clinical complete response, remember clinical CR is only PCR in 20% of the time. And if you are given anti therapy, then clinical PCR is 70% pathological PCR. In luminal A, clinical PCR is only 11% pathological CR. So if a patient has achieved clinical and ultrasound uh -huh. MO, clinical response, always it is recommended to biopsy the supraclavicular node. Remember, not lymphadenectomy. Because if you end up with a primary tumor PCR, axilla PCR, if you have not biopsied supraclavicular, you don't know whether it is PCR or still isolated tumor cells or RCB score 0, 01. So if clinical and Clinical CR has been achieved. Supraclavicular node biopsy to prove is it also pathological CR is recommended. Now, if there was a supraclavicular node and there is a tumor and patient has not achieved a complete response, then if it is palpable node, we remove so radiation can take care supraclavicularly. If it is not a palpable node seen on an imaging in presence of a viable tumor already in primary, then it is not mandatory to remove supraclavicular node. So, in nutshell. Supraclavicular node is removed to prove whether there is a pathological complete response or not. And if you remove it, it is only a removal 
and all the patients of supraclavicular are followed up with radiation to supraclavicular area but never to axilla when you have done axillary clearance arvind has a question new adjuvant par millimeter in braca positive is there any evidence in it all i think we have already uh, discussed uh, par millimeters uh, in the management of locally advanced breast cancer so as of now remember uh, in a adjuvant new adjuvant no metastatic setting yes upfront par millimeter in a braca positive there is a role Uh, but not in a new adjuvant uh, setting at this moment adjuvant setting braca yeah, par millimeter in braca yes metastatic first line yes yes not new adjuvant in new adjuvant we have a trial of immunotherapy with chemo yes single agent immunotherapy new adjuvant yes adjuvant uh, you know uh, cdk4 inhibitor amiba cyclin yes but new adjuvant not please read about all this trial so i think uh, it was a fantastic thing vijay and you know we this shows that it can never end it keep going going, going. <laughs> uh, you will have to get back uh, to the good uh, as i yeah. always tell our student uh, you know our job is not spoon feeding we are not in first standard second standard you gave all the concept if any slide of your had a concept a trial and an evidence student you have shown a path you have stimulated their mind now they have to take that path and read them sir that is a job of a mentor mentor is not spoon feeder he enlightens the brain shows the path and the student has to walk through that path you are a very slide of your had a beautiful evidence a very alternate slide has a concept i loved it thank you very much vijay and all our thanks to the uh, nbe and the dnb board and the students for a fantastic talk your knowledge the treasure of knowledge in breast we we'll invite you again some other time for probably a case discussion on a breast as an examiner mock exam thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much over to nami yeah thank you very much uh, dr vijay for the presentation and thank you very much uh, professor dr somashekar for joining us and thank you trainees and faculty members for joining us have a good day bye